The views, comments, stories, and opinions shared within this podcast are my own or those of my guests and in no way represent the views of the company or companies that I or we work for. All stories, events, and tales shared within this episode may or may not have happened in the manner in which they are told. They may or may not have even happened at all. The details have been changed to protect the innocent and the guilty alike. This is Squawk Ident. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Squawk Ident an aviation podcast dedicated to the journey and the challenges surrounding the life and career of Aviator Tony, an airline pilot currently flying for a legacy airline with close to 20 years on the flight line. This is episode 16 of Squawk Ident, recorded on the 28th of December, 2019. From the Aviator Mobile Studios 314 of the Hampton Inn and Suites in beautiful San Juan, Puerto Rico. On this very special episode of Squawk Ident, Aviator Tony has the opportunity to sit down with a mainline captain from Legacy Airlines. They take the time to discuss the journey that Captain Hans has navigated in his rise to his position as an Airbus captain for a major U.S.-based airline. Aviator Tony also outlines the sequence flown with Captain Hans and the adventure they shared on their walkabout through old San Juan. All this and more on this episode of Squawk Ident. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Right after a brief word from our sponsors. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Well, uh, here we are, episode 16, and just to recap a little bit from our last episode, we sat down with Captain Roger and discussed what can go wrong out on the line and how it's not always a textbook solution. From FADEC failures, abnormalities, BFRs, CFIs, pilot errors, and more. So if you have not yet listened to episode 15, I encourage you to check it out right after this episode. But first... On a very special episode of Squawk Ident, I am joined in the Mobile Aviator Studios by a captain that has a reputation at Legacy Airlines as being one of the most knowledgeable, sharpest, and most easygoing and kind individuals around. His journey in aviation started over three decades ago in Prescott, Arizona. And on his journey in a career in aviation, he has found himself flying all kinds of aircraft, from Cessnas to Duchesses, King Airs and Metroliners, MD-90, 737s, 7576, MD-88s, and currently an A320 family of aircraft. Please help me in welcoming to the show, Mr. Captain Hans. How are you? Hi, Captain. Thanks. Glad to be here. Well, here we are in the middle of a trip. We've uh, flown together more than a few times now. Yes. And uh, every single time it's been a relatively uh, positive experience. I think we, we get along really well. Okay. And it's always a pleasure to be in an aircraft, flying the line at work, and really getting along with your, your pilot and sitting next to you. And I thank you for that. It's, it's actually a big pleasure to have that. And I thank, and I thank you. It's, uh, you hit on all the, all the important things. It's, uh, it's easy to work with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. So we're currently in the mix of uh, the 2019 holiday travel season. And with that comes an increase of passengers behaving badly. People that don't normally fly, I guess. And in this very sequence, we started out together. We hadn't seen each other in about a year. About a year, yeah. And uh, first leg together, you know, we, we said our hellos at our typical, you know, have you been that I've, I've spoken about a little bit in previous episodes. Um, but we, you know, we say, hey, good flying with you. Good to see you. We're going to have a fun trip. And this trip actually is, is not too bad. It's got a couple red eyes in it, which is kind of a negative. Challenging, yeah. yeah. But here we are in Puerto Rico and yeah. had a really great time today, I got to say. Yeah. And uh, we started this trip out on the very first leg with a little bit of excitement, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, we never even left the gate. Hadn't even left the gate. And as uh, sometimes happens, and we've mentioned before uh, in, in previous episodes, we had an intoxicated passenger on the aircraft. Right. Yeah. And how do you recall uh, 
what exactly happened there? Yeah, our uh, our number one flight attendant came up front and uh, uh, said that uh, there actually was a flight attendant sitting next to this passenger. She was uh, he or she. I never did find out if it was uh, him or her. Huh. Was non revving in uh, in the seat next to this first class passenger, and uh, they both felt like there was a uh, heavy um, smell of alcohol. And uh, then the passenger very promptly proceeded to demand drinks. And uh, and the flight attendant said, you know, you might want to slow down. And that kind of led to a little exchange of words. But, um, yeah, it was uh, readily apparent that uh, at least we suspected that there was alcohol involved. And um, it's not up to us to uh, make the final determination. So we got... Uh, we got a supervisor involved, and it uh, t- took a while for them to get there, but eventually they did determine that the passenger did have a few drinks, and they were trying to push it on us to maybe look the other way. It's not so bad, but uh, we'd already made our decision that we uh, we didn't want it. We, uh, we, we were uh, more convinced that it was uh, safer to assume he had too much than to err on the uh, possibility that something could happen down the line and say, well, we already knew that there was some alcohol involved. Right. Right, yeah. which would fall on our responsibility as well, right? Yes, yes, it would have been. Yeah. yeah. So and why is this a big deal? I know I've I've had friends that don't fly regularly, um, that are not in the aviation field, and they they hear these stories, you know, occasionally at dinner parties and whatnot, and and uh, they're like, well, so what's the big deal, you know? And the big deal, as you know, uh, but maybe our, some of our viewers or our listeners don't know, is that there's an actual FAR regulation. The right. FAA has has put in the federal aviation regulation of part of what we do as airline is 121 operations. That's the chapter in the book that, that talks about airlines. And in 121.575, for those of you who like to Google things, it clearly states that when it comes to alcoholic beverages, the certificate holder uh, it may uh, not allow any one person to board an aircraft if that person appears to be intoxicated. Doesn't smell like toxicated. Doesn't have no proof that they were drinking, but appears, appears to be. So it's it's a pretty tight regulation. Now, do people sneak on? And you don't really realize that they're intoxicated until halfway through the flight. Right, happens all the time. Right, right? and then that becomes a big issue. Um, if you know the flight's a boring flight, which we all strive for, uh, and nothing happens, big deal, right? Right. But what happens when either that passenger becomes unruly, makes it uncomfortable for those that paid good money to sit next to them, or we have an in-flight emergency and now we have to egress the aircraft, now you're going to have some guys stumbling maybe at the exit, blocking... Inca- incapacitated, yeah. Right? And, yeah. and now what? How many people are going to possibly right. get injured or even die from something that was held up in the... E-back? Yeah, I would say... You know, like most of the federal aviation regulations, you can basically uh, uh, go back and, and trace it and say, why is this law there? Why is this regulation there? And of course, there's a long history of drunk people getting on airplanes and causing all kinds of problems. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's now it's in there. It's in the books. It says, uh, if you appear to be intoxicated, they're not going to take you. Yeah. And the regulation does uh, come into many other... Um details uh, about people traveling with people that appear to be intoxicated, um, you know, people that are armed cannot have drinks on an aircraft. Uh, and I just revisited this, this reg for the purpose of talking about it today and, and actually had forgotten that, yeah, if a Leo comes on board for whatever reason, and, and a police officer or whatever, an, an agent of the government, and they have their, their firearm with them, I forgot that they cannot be served cannot alcohol. Be served, right? yeah, yeah, so... You know, it's good to revisit these kind of things once in a while. Sure. Okay. Uh, but yeah, a little bit of excitement on our trip so far. You know, it, it was. Yeah, it was, and and it's a typical thing where we have a, a line that we have to draw, and and uh, you know, the I think the customer agent uh, was kind of hoping that we would just go along with their word that it seemed to be okay. Sure. And uh, they always forget that we're the ones that are. Yeah. On the airplane, we'll have to deal with it. And they so. want them out of their hair. They're less right. paperwork for them. Absolutely. Now they don't have to rebook, reschedule, right. and have to make an assessment whether they can even fly on the next right. flight. If not, how bad the situation is, maybe they get blacklisted. I've yes. seen that happen, right? Yes. 
So, so that, you know, it's a little unfortunate that we had to deal with that. We ended up, what, 30 minutes behind schedule? Something like that, um, yeah. On that first leg. But uh, this sequence was not that bad. I know we both kind of talked a little bit about it earlier today about, you know, we kind of looked at it and going, man, maybe we should trade out of this trip or because it's a little bit tough. I mean, here we are. It's uh, the day after Christmas is when we started. Right. And we did that uh, first leg was L.A. to Charlotte. Yeah. And it was a late night flight, not not a red eye by any means. A uh, relatively quick sit in Charlotte with an aircraft swap. Correct. And we ended up in Austin, Texas. Late. Late. Very yeah. late. Uh, got on schedule, a, but late. On schedule. Yeah, we, we caught up. But um, but yeah, we got in, what, 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. in the morning. So yeah, you know. You get your rest, and we got to spend the entire day in Austin. And you had a little bit of fun uh, out there visiting some place I didn't even know existed and originated in Austin, which right. was the uh, the Texas Tower for the uh, infamous shooting in nineteen sixty six. Yep, yep, the Texas Tower, and and a lot of memories came back there. And before my time, but we definitely studied about it right. in school. And and you also went to a really cool place for lunch. Yeah, so Whole Foods Market was started in uh, 1980 or 82 in uh, in Austin, and uh, so their flagship store is there. And obviously, they're you know they're now they're a major uh, corporation and they got stores everywhere. But the original one is there, and it's uh, it's pretty cool. It's pretty nice to go there. Yeah, and yeah. I think next time I go, I'm gonna definitely venture out to check that out. I like Whole yeah, Foods. Yeah. yeah, so a great place to grab lunch. Um, I. Uh... I pretty much had a pretty relaxing day, you know, especially coming off of two weeks of vacation. Plus, I had training before that, so I hadn't been in an airplane in like thirty days. So and it was a full day. Um, yeah. We we blocked uh, north of seven thirty that day. I think. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah. It, it's it was quite a long day, flight time. Yeah, flight time. Yeah. Um, and in the dark mostly. Mm -hmm. So you know that does play a toll. So yeah, I I hit the gym and grabbed lunch and and walked around downtown. It was a really nice city, a university city. You know, yeah. University of Texas Great of town. Austin. Yeah. Great layover. So we left there 8 o'clock at night, right. uh, 8 o'clock departure, and yeah. uh, we ended up going to DFW. Not bad. Really, really fast flight. Yeah. And then we had that sit hour and 30 right. minutes or something like yeah. that. Turned in a little bit longer because the inbound flight Got was a late. Delayed. Yeah. yeah. And, and this happens. Right. You know? So we're, yeah. here we are. We're sitting. We're grabbing a quick bite to eat because we know it's going to be too late to get anything. Right. Plus, uh, we were landing in San Juan with the time change and everything. We were, la we were landing here at 5.30 in the morning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, uh, we had a four, what was it blocked for? 4.30, 4.31, I think, yeah. is what we four actually and a half did. Hour flight, yeah. yeah. So, again, aircraft swap in Dallas, a little bit of a sit, grabbed a quick bite to eat, and red eye over to San Juan. And the sit is the one that uh, often is hard to overcome because when you are... Uh, when you just or when you once you're working it's okay it's that stop and go the go will very often uh take a toll on you yeah absolutely yeah, yeah i i find that uh any sit more than an hour and a half especially if you're at an airport where you don't have a quiet place it's hard to relax it's, it's the noise pollution i've always am i'm big on noise yeah you know here i am doing an an audio uh, recording and a medium with a podcasting which is right up my alley because I can't stand how noisy airports get, especially this time of year. Yes. It used to be airports, you know, had carpeting and, and acoustic tiles, but now with modernization, everything's tile or those um, epoxy flooring and sound bounces off everything, high ceilings, open concepts. And it's just, and then the PA is constantly going. It can be fatiguing if you're sitting there with the passengers waiting for an aircraft to come in. You know, Tony, I don't know that I've ever thought about it, but, you know, <laughs> it's going to be on my mind now. Uh, you're right. It is a loud environment, and I know for a fact, I mean, we wear uh, noise-canceling he headsets not just, to, uh, not just to save our hearing, but because it is less fatiguing. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. You know, yeah. It, Occasionally, it you'll see yeah. a pilot, you know, uh, in Dallas especially. Uh, it's a pretty big airport. Uh, the, the airline that we currently fly for, the Legacy Airlines. Um, it has a pretty big footprint in Dallas, as anyone can kind of figure that out. But uh, we often see pilots walking past with those quiet comfort bows. Heads, heads, heads on, and yeah. I'm thinking, uh, you know, the first couple times I saw that years back, I thought, yeah, it's kind of tacky. You're, you're in uniform. You're in the public eye. I you agree. should, you know. But now that... Necessity. I kind of see it as pretty smart yeah. because you're saving that. You're not going to be as fatigued. 
right when you're doing that three legs with you had two sets between flights you know i i haven't done it yet um i i keep thinking i have a hard time overcoming the uh the 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 image in my head of the teenage kid you know bobbing to his you know rock right. group or something got the beats on and he's like <laughs> yeah. yeah but i mean there's you gotta a do what you gotta do those you know? headsets yeah. are getting smaller i know they have the inner ear noise counseling now right so those are maybe a little bit less uh visible Intrusive, but yeah, yeah I, I i think i might kind of do that maybe not in the public eye but maybe when i'm sitting at a gate well let us know what what results you get out yeah, of it I'm, I'm, i'd be curious to know yeah. i'd like to see uh even some of the uh, airline unions kind of do a study on that uh yeah not to give any airlines the idea that that can constitute as a, <laughs> as a sleep area or as a rest area or anything like that right but you know this this is what this uh, podcast is all about um as you you come to find out here recently, and, and I, my listeners know, is uh, the Squawk Ident podcast is a place to explore the perspectives that, uh, that I and my guests share on an aviator's journey. And every, every aviator that I've flown with over the few uh, years here at Legacy and over, the, over a decade uh, at my previous carrier, uh, you know, we all have these unique and interesting journeys that we have. Some of them are relatively similar to others, but they're all unique in their own way. And, uh, you know, we discuss many modern day challenges that a career airline pilot can expect along the way. And what I wanted to start off today with you is just, first of all, thank you for agreeing to sit down with me on this layover. Um, we had a wonderful time today, which I will kind of get into maybe later in the show. Um, but, you know, it's, it's been a, a nice layover. It's been you know, relaxing, but we also got out and got to see old San Juan and yeah. we got to get a run in together. Yeah, it was a quality. Which was great. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'd like to talk to you about today is specifically your journey. I'm very interested. I mean, I, I know a little bit about it because I have the luxury of flying with you now multiple times. And since we do get it uh, you know, together and, and hit it off every time we fly together, you know, we kind of go back and forth talking about family and our journey. And what I really like to ask you is how you got this idea in your head that you might be interested in becoming an aviator. I mean, what age did you start to realize this? So it's interesting that you say I got an idea in my head because I don't remember a time in which I did not want to be a pilot. Um, I, I only remember uh, always wanting to be a pilot. So um, it was definitely a childhood dream. And uh, no one in the family was in aviation, so it was my dream. Um, so I, I don't remember ever a time when I did not, not want to be a pilot or, uh, enjoyed being a pilot. Um, so no. you started out, um, at a very young age before you can remember, really. You know, I, I got memories of my dad taking us to the airport, my brother and I, who's, he, who's not a pilot. And, uh, and it would be just like, you know, saying you take your kids to, um, you know, the train station or you take them to, uh, the harbor to look at ships or something. So we'd go to the airport and we'd see planes take off and I'd see these old DC-6s and stuff fly around. Um, not really thinking yet about the pilot side, but, oh, I love airplanes. I definitely like things that fly. I didn't care if it was a helicopter or a, or a balloon or, you know, or, or a glider. It was like, wow, I was interested. I liked it. I don't yeah. remember ever not liking things that flew. Yeah, I think um, most of us are kind of like that. I mean, right. I don't know anybody that goes, well, I was doing this and then I decided today I'm going to go fly. Right, and then I, I don't. I think the line, the, the line is probably blurry and and thin. But you know, at, at some point, uh, you know, we all become teenagers, and then it's like, hey, what do you want to do? Hey, what do you want to become? You know, I was like, well, I want to be cool. I want to be an airline pilot. Yeah. <laughs> and so you you kind of started. Was it right out of high school or? I did. Yeah, I graduated uh, high school in um, May, and uh, I was uh, enrolled in college in June. And I think I started flying probably like in July or August. Okay. Um, and then I, I remember I soloed on December 7th because, you know, obviously it's a special date. So, yeah, December 7th I soloed. Yeah. Yeah. That was what? Uh, the day Han less soloed. Than, less than six, less than seven months out of high school, um, which uh -huh. I know compared to other people who, you know, soloed on their 16th birthday. So but for eight, me, that was, that was pretty cool. 18 years old. Yep. For solo. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and this was in Prescott? Prescott, yeah. Okay, so you decided to go to Prescott, Arizona, and, and you weren't there very long, from no. what I recall. Yeah, no. Uh, the, uh, the rate at which I was burning through the money was uh, uh, scandalous, yeah. because uh, obviously it's an expensive college. Um, so I, I found something that was a, 
better priced. Yeah. And I went to California. I went to a place called Sierra Academy. It doesn't exist anymore. And I uh, and I continued. So I, I did uh, most of the private in uh, Prescott, and then I went and did all my commercial and and uh, instrument ratings, all that stuff at the uh, Sierra, Sierra Academy. Academy. That yeah. was uh, Oakland in the Bay Area. Oakland, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So that program, you took that from instrument rating all the way through, was it CFI, double IMEI? Correct. Okay. And so you were flying mainly Cessna 52s, 72s, and you Correct. said uh, you mentioned earlier a Duchess. For, for your twin? twins, we used beach Duchesses, yeah. Okay, and how was that? It was fun. Great yeah. airplane, yeah. Any any kind of tricks of that airplane that uh, was always kind of like, a, I gotcha? No, I remember being a little bit intimidated when I first started flying. It's like, wow, this was a little bit bigger than the 172. Yeah. Um, you know, clearly more power. But um, I uh, I have a fond memory of the Duchess. It was a... It was a very docile, great airplane to fly. So when you graduated uh, from all your ratings, were you then instructing at the same flight center? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And, and how was that? Um, I actually have good memories of it. I mean, I, I know it was one of those dreadful steps people have to take where you think, oh, I don't want to be a flight engineer. I don't, I don't want to be a flight instructor. But um, I, I enjoyed flight instructing. I, I really did. Yeah. Um, I couldn't wait to get on to better things, but I didn't dread it or hate it. Yeah. So I, I got good fond memories of that time. How long did you do that for? Um, two, two and a half years. Okay, so quite a bit of time. You built probably 1,500 hours or so, or at least. Yeah, I think it was more. Yeah. I think it was more. But we flew a lot. I mean, to fly, uh, to fly 100 hours a month was not unusual, you know. Oh, really? Yeah. And this was 80... So this would have been 88 through uh, 90. So flying flight instruction was still pretty popular and pre-9-11 era of training. Yes. Not that expensive. Yes. Didn't have high insurance costs, high yes. you know, rental costs. And-, and the school would have, um, the school would have um, like I remember one time we had, I don't know how many there were total, but we had these, um, they were first officers flying for... Um, I don't remember the country, but they were flying, um, I want to say like 727s and 737s, mm. F-27s and F-28s. Okay. Okay, so variety, but bigger airplanes, passenger airplanes. They sure. were flying them as uh, co-pilots, and then they were sent to us to fly. Each one of them had to fly like 100 hours on the twin, which was awesome, and then do an ATP check ride. Huh. They had... Tons of time, but in heavier airplanes. Sure. And so now they're sitting in this little Duchess. Right. And I remember the DC-10 FOs, they would try to flare that thing, you know, at 100 feet. Yeah. And it's like, well, that's not going to work. But um, it was uh, nice because you would get three or four of these guys. Each one of them represented, you know, 100 hours of twin time. Yeah. And they were already pilots. So all you had to do is just sort of hone them, hone them up a little bit, you know. Sure. Polish them up a little bit. And, uh, but it was, it was a lot of good quality and these um, were airline pilots that were coming in because they were getting ready to upgrade or they whatever. They were getting ready to upgrade and needed the ATP. They were I all see. commercial pilots. Yeah. They had tons of time. And, uh, and so it was fun instructing. It was not just teaching someone, you know, yeah. hey, this is an airplane. This is how it flies. Yeah. And up yeah. until the five years ago, I think, when they changed the regulation, uh, in order to fly a 121 operator as a first officer in the right seat, uh, you didn't need to have an ATP. You just needed to have the commercial multi rating. That's the way it was back and then. And yeah. then, due to as we've discussed in previous episodes, the Colgan crash, Congress got involved, uh, the FAA got involved, and and they said, okay, this these kind of things cannot happen anymore. And the regulation changed. And now, if you're going to fly for a 121 operator in the United States, you cannot fly for them unless you have in hand an ATP. Right. And there are some restricted ATP. Uh, procedures that can be obtained uh, prior military with flight time uh, is one of the restrictions. I think um, if you go to a a career college and get a degree in some kind of aeronautical sciences uh, commensurate with your training, you can get also a restricted ATP, and there might be another one there that I'm not remembering right now. But uh, So now you have to have an ATP, so those kind of things. Yeah. Or have changed over the years, but so that was really an interesting thing to experience because you were able to do some marketing there, weren't you? Like with guys that were flying for an airline. Yeah. 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 
I, I definitely got exposed. Uh, it, it was interesting because they were, uh, I mean, these these were guys that used to flying around the globe, you know, especially like, you know, some of the DC-10 FOs, you know, they were, they were used to flying around the globe for their airline. Sure. And uh, they had interesting stories to tell. I bet. Yeah. 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 And so what what was the progression there? What allowed you to move forward from sitting there instructing to moving on to the next step in your aviation career? Well, I had got the ATP. Um, so I had the hours for the ATP, you know, and then I, I took my ATP and, um, hiring was a little bit slow. This is, you know, now we're looking at the late eighties, early nineties, things weren't flying yet. They were still doing good, but they hadn't stopped yet. And, uh, so it was, you know, starting to send applications. Um, I found without exception, every job I've gotten flying without exception, every single one of them, it was never about the hours I had. And it was never about what I knew. It was always about who I knew. Yeah. Because every one of them was facilitated by someone walking in a resume, someone in putting a good word, or someone personally knowing me and saying, yeah, I'll give you a job. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And different time. Different time. Nowadays, yes. I don't think that kind of, um, you know, getting your foot in the door that way is prevalent simply because of the way technology is kind of taken over. Now we're talking at algorithms and you have to fill out these surveys online. Sure. And because I know at legacy airlines, uh, you can write letters of recommendation to people that you think be a good fit for the company, right. but you, you can't hand in an application. I mean, the chief pilot won't even take it. Right. So now it's all, you got to go through the website, you got to go through HR. Yeah. There is no favoritism or anything yes. uh, because they're trying to prevent that. Um, so, I mean, it's, ex it's, very fortunate that you got to experience that, and that really opened up a lot of doors. Oh, absolutely. I, I don't think I could duplicate the path that I took if I tried it again. There's, there's yeah. no way, because it was just, there was a lot of being at the right time, at the right place. And again, um, you know, I, I'm a, my first job flying uh, um, after flight instructing, uh, my former chief flight instructor, my, you know, my former boss, uh, called me up one day and said, hey, we're, we're looking for a guy to fly um, part-time on a King Air. And it was a small gig. It was just paid by the day. But um, for a young kid, you know, looking for turbine experience, it was an awesome thing. Yeah. So uh, so I, I got a job flying a King Air part-time um, because of a phone call from a friend, basically, yeah. from my former boss. Yeah. yeah. And, and so you got your King Air time, and were you still instructing on the side? I was uh, not instructing at that point. I was just doing a uh, face check. So it was a 141 school. And uh, I think all I did at that point was just face checks. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you kind of had that opportunity to get that King Air time. And how did that progress into, at that point, I think you said a regional opportunity? So one of my former coworkers um, and friend walked in my resume at uh, one of the. Uh, one of the commuters mm -hmm. and, and, you know, put in a word and, and then I got a call from them and they liked my total time and they liked the turbine time that I had and they offered me a job. So you were at this point, you're still in the Bay area. Yeah. And so you got offered a job and you had, did you have to move at yeah. that point? Yeah. So you moved up to the Northwest. Correct. And you were flying, what was it? Metro liners? Metro liners. Yeah. yeah. And how's that aircraft to fly? Um, well, it was a it was a handful when I first started in it. It was obviously the big, biggest, baddest, fastest airplane I'd ever flown. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, I mean, in hindsight, it, it was kind of a complex airplane. A lot, of, a lot of the automation that we were so used to having today, you know, it was like it was all digital and no autopilot. You had to fly every leg hand flown. Oh, you know, yeah. You alternated, you know, one leg in each seat. Um, you know, one leg the FO, one leg the captain type thing. Sure, but um. But yeah, it was a, the Metroliner was a beast when I first got in it. I thought, wow, wow. I I'll never conquer this thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, and how long did it take you to, you know, everyone has this period of adjustment. You know, you, you're, you're typed or you're, you're qualified on the aircraft, whatever it is. You're, you're trained. You've been given the blessing from the Czech airman, the, the, the APD, whatever it is, the sim mm -hmm. instructor mm -hmm. that checked you out. Then you get on the line. You, you finish your IOE, which is your initial operating experience. And, and that Czech airman gives you their blessing. And, okay, now you're out there on the line flying with captains that are regular line captains. And now you're just a regular Joe Schmo. just a regular right. Joe Schmo. And you got to remember everything you've just been, you know, drinking from that fire hose of information. Right. 
and you get on the line. How long did it take you at that initial airline job to kind of settle into the cockpit to the point where you felt confident enough that, like, if something happened to my captain next to me, I've got this? Well, I think at any point I felt like I could have, I, I think I would have been capable. Um, but I remember um, on the Metroliner when I took my check ride, the captain that uh, gave it to me, a uh, real nice guy, and he said, it's going to take you a year for the airplane to teach you how it wants to be flown. <laughs> and I, I remember thinking that that was, that was really uh, interesting because it was about a year uh, later that I felt like, okay, I, I know how to fly the Metroliner. Uh, now, I knew the procedures. I could fly it. But it took a year for me to figure out what that airplane liked and what it, would, what, what it could do. You know, I felt comfortable in a year. Yeah. Yeah. So about it, about about 12 months of flying the line mm -hmm. to where, you know, you got all four seasons in at least. And then felt pretty confident. Yeah. And how long did that profession or that job opportunity last? Was that four, four or five years that you were there? Or? Just shy of seven. So seven years. And yeah. did you, you never upgraded though? I did, yeah. You did upgrade. Okay, so you upgraded at the regional. I did. Yeah, I did. I did um, so when I got hired there, it was like, hey, six months, you guys are going to be captains on the Metroliner. And uh, two years later, <laughs> still I hadn't moved. I don't think a number in yeah. seniority. It was just everything was so stagnated. Yeah. Um, so I left the Metroliner and went to the Dash 8 as an FO just to fly a nicer airplane. And then I flew the uh, Dash 8 um, for three more years. So I was, at f I was just over five years with the company when I got the call for the upgrade. Okay. And then I had just shy of two years uh, flying a Metroliner as a captain. Okay, so you went back to the Metroliner as a yeah. captain. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, so there you are, a regional. And by now, it's the uh, mid-90s. Right, and you're like, okay, I I I want to progress. I see my friends, as we all do, at a regional people. They take risk. They they go other places and they end up flying whatever opportunities. Even though you think, oh, that might be a little risky, but and so you've seen people leave and come and go, and now it's your turn, your, your decision to to do something else, right. to move forward, to right. to get that, you know, the goal of reaching the tip of the pyramid. What were your steps from being in the left seat of a Metroliner, making okay money at the time, at least mm -hmm. up to that point. Yeah. Um, and you decide, okay, now it's time for me to go. It's not just throwing your applications out there because, as you know, that usually doesn't produce results. So what? how did you get the results? Well, once again, someone helped me out. Somebody, uh, a friend of mine, a neighbor, someone I'd flown with, a captain I'd flown with, had uh, gotten hired at yet another airline and um it was not an airline that was on my scope i it wasn't on my radar um you know we were all sending resumes to um delta and northwest and united and you know all the big guys all, all yeah. the big guys so they all had them you yeah. know and they'd send you a little letter saying thanks you know keep us updated sure but you know everybody there i mean with 660 pilots at horizon i think all of us had applications in with everybody sure um this was not this was a small carrier one that was um had just started a few years earlier, was definitely not on my radar. But um, someone who I uh, definitely, um, whose opinion I, I admired a lot, I respected a lot, left and went to work for them. And, uh, and I'm like, ah, you know, pay attention. I mean, this guy doesn't do, uh, he doesn't do things just for fun. I mean, he thinks things thoroughly. Yeah. You know, and his thing was, look, everybody at Horizon, we all have got, Oogles of turbo prop time. We've got PIC time. We've got everything they want. You got to do something to stand out. Yeah. Well, his solution was get some turbo jet time. Get some jet time. And we had jets at Horizon. Um, we had the F 28s. Um, and it was uh, like, well, I didn't want to go back to the right seat. So, right. Yeah. So there well, you were. And so he says, hey, come on, submit your application. It was, They're hiring. It, it was, he was in training. And the first break that he got, I said, come on over. We'll barbecue at my back, you know, we'll barbecue back in my house. And, you know, I'm going to just pick your brain and ask you 100 million questions about what's going on. Yeah. And within an hour, I was convinced, you know what, I've got to give this a try. So right then and there, we typed out a resume. And when he left, I gave him my resume. And two days later, he walked it in. And I think four days later, I got a call saying, hey, we'd like to give you an interview. Wow. I mean, it was pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. You you interviewed. Uh, how did that interview go? Okay. The interview went well. Yeah. 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 Standard, you know, 
questions, HR questions, a little technical. HR test wasn't and, big. Uh, yeah. The one question I remember them asking is complete the following sentence. I wish I was more. Wow. Yep. And I wasn't expecting it. And I thought you can answer this all kinds of different ways wrong. So I said, lucky. Uh, I felt it was pretty safe to say, I yeah. wish I was more lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't, don't say things like, I wish I was more assertive. <laughs> right. <laughs> you exactly. know, the pilot doesn't want, yeah. No. Yeah. You don't want to say, you don't want to go that road. You want to be, you know, more humble, but maybe. <laughs> I think things have definitely changed because I hear now when I fly with um, younger people that have gone through the interview process, yeah, I understand HR is a totally different beast now. Mm. I mean, that was face to face um, with a couple of Czech airmen and chief pilots, and uh, it was pretty straight, pretty uh, straightforward. A couple yeah. of flying questions. Um, Did you have to do any simulator uh, on day out? two? Yeah. Day so two. on day one, they kind of weeded us down, and then you had to wait for after lunch, and then if your name was on the list, they gave you a ticket, and they said. Here's a ticket to uh, Los Angeles where the simulator is, and yeah. tomorrow you fly the sim. Excellent. And you, yeah. you told me a little bit of a story about that that I found fascinating. So they put you in, what kind of sim was it? It was an MD-80. So they put you in MD-80. You've never been in an MD-80 cockpit before. No. You know, here you are, you've been flying, you know, Metroliners and Dash 8s. A little bit different beast. I mean, I'm sure, you know, the instrumentation is all there. The basics are all there, but... And they just told you, just make the call outs you normally would right, on the Metroliner. Right. Because they weren't really looking for you to know flows. So obviously, you weren't going to know them. They were looking to see if you can handle complex, quite faster airplanes, really. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't really know if I would say um, complex or faster airplanes. It was sort of like, how do you manage your cockpit, you know? Mm. Do you remember to call for a gear up? Do you remember to call for flaps? Do you remember to call for a checklist? Huh. I, I, don't, I don't know because uh, they really weren't trying to see if you could fly. A again, years later, uh, in a conversation with a Czech airman that gave me that, that uh, sim ride, mm -hmm. he said, you know, we know everybody can fly an ILS at that point. So what we're looking for is just your style. You know, how are you managing the cockpit? When are you calling for this? Are you going to get flustered? Because we know you haven't flown this airplane before. So are you going to get flustered when something happens that, you weren't expecting yeah. and and it did you know i mean the, the airplane was faster than anything i'd ever flown before yeah and when i was told to maintain it at a certain speed i uh did not realize that an md80 level at ten thousand feet would accelerate to 300, 320 knots in no time yeah yeah and uh, i was told to maintain it at i don't know 250 or something i was like whoa yeah and so fast. what set you apart i think from from what we've talked about in the past is is that you recognized it and you just kept flying and you, you corrected it. You corrected the situation that you got fast, like you said, you were supposed to maintain 250 and you just kept aviating. What happened in the past happened in the past. You move forward and you're always looking forward. You're not obsessing over, oh crap, I missed, I just screwed that up. I'm going to ruin my resume, my application here or my, my interview and I'm gonna, they're not going to hire me. And you start getting in your head in no. the sim when it's, none of that stuff is important. You're flying the airplane. You need to fly the airplane. You've got to yeah. fly the airplane. And that's what they want to do. They want to see the, those that can maintain their right. composure continue to fly the aircraft and those that freak out and just stop flying. Right. So, and, and thankfully you, you passed that interview, you got on with that airline and you were there. How many years? Are you Two saying? and a half. Two and a half years. And then mergers and acquisitions. Correct. And you went from flying a, a small air, uh, aircraft outfit to one of the big three. Yeah. And as you are now at legacy airlines with me, um, and your journey there was actually pretty exciting as well. You got to fly a handful of airplanes there. Yes. So you started out, you know, you were on the MD-90. MD-90. And then the merger happened. And after a period of transition, you had the big, as you said, it, uh, what was it? The big integration or the, the seniority Listing. What oh, the mob. It? Well, the, the mob have to, the, the mother of all bids. Is that what you're talking The mother about? of all bids. The yes. mother of all bids. Yes, the mob. What... Yeah. That one came uh, around 2002, uh, post uh, 9 11. So 9 11 happened. Yeah. The company had to do something. Right. And they needed to find a way to furlough the appropriate people based not just on seniority, but on many factors. Because right. at the time, Legacy acquired not just one 
small outfit. They require right before nine eleven. They bought another they, uh, yeah. sizable carrier. Another yeah. sizable. So they had all these different carriers, different yeah. you know bid statuses, and they had to make the mother of all bid, as you said it. Yeah. Um, so that happened, and where did you end up? Uh, on the MD. So I, I went when I started off. I was on the MD ninety, mm -hmm. and about a year into it, they retired it. Uh, okay. So that gave me a displacement. I flew the seven six. And I was on the 76 uh, on 9-11. And then on the, when the MOAB came out, the mother of all bids, uh, that left me at the same base where I wanted to be, but at the very, very bottom uh -huh. of the MD-80. Uh -huh. And MD-80, you know, not unlike the MD-90, same... Yeah, basic yeah. Is it the same type rating as well, or uh, is it a supplemental? Yeah, no, it's the same. It's same. a DC nine, DC nine type rating. DC nine yeah. type rating, and it yeah. works for all. So here you are. You went to an airplane you were familiar with. Mm -hmm. How long were you on that MD eighty? Four years, three months, and twenty one days. Now, nice. Yeah, down to the day. Yeah, and then seven three, and then uh, back to the seven six. Seven six again. Yeah. Okay. And were you always around the same base? I was always in the same base. Yeah, yeah. I like my West Coast base. Until they closed it in 2012. Okay, so no more, uh, no more Northern California. Nope, no more driving, driving to the airport. airport. Yeah. Now you got to drive to the airport and commute. Yep. Um, and as my, you know, my listeners know, I'm a Los Angeles based uh, pilot on the A321, and you ended up on the 320 family as well. Um, we first flew together. God, I was pretty new with the company. I, I was still on probation, I think. You were finishing your. You told me you were doing your probation. Um, Post probation interview yeah. that day when we landed in LA. So you, I was there to, at least what is it nine months? Nine months, months I think something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've had a pretty exciting time together. We've never really had major issues come up while we were flying. Uh, minor things like what we dealt with the other day, right? But you know, your process and your journey is is very interesting because that process is not something that someone who just starts out in aviation in the last say five years they're familiar with because right. the industry has changed even from when i started and you know i've been doing this a couple decades you've been doing this three decades plus so there has been a lot of uh development a lot of change a lot of process changes so it's it's nice to hear how a journey can be so lucrative um, and, and we've, I've had other guests on shows that they're, you know, would love to be at a 121 operator at a mainline, but because of the choices they made, made not bad, not good, but just choices they made, they ended up struggling financially, struggling to find employment, struggling to get their application out there. And because things are a little bit different now, I can't just go grab his resume and submit it. I mean, I've, I've done everything I've can. I, right. I can for my friends and for the people that I know would absolutely make a, an excellent pilot yes. uh, here. Um, but unfortunately, it's just HR is what it is. You know, right. It's all about liability. And, and Tony, I, I didn't know that. I, I, I did not know that. Um, I, I just, it's, it's funny because once you're through the door, you don't really look back and go, oh, is that door still a viable entry? You know, does that still work? You know, I mean, it's funny. I've got, uh, 20 some years here now with, you know, legacy and sorry, but you know, you kind of stop thinking about, Hey, what's it like to get of course, in? Of course. You, yeah. you know, you, you just get on with your life. So, uh, I, you remember world airways? Yeah. Yeah. They went bankrupt. I don't know, a handful of years ago. And, uh, I had two good friends that were working there. MD 11 type rated Czech airman captain, you know, and, yeah. um, like, Hey, can you help me out? Can you, uh, can you walk a resume in or something for me? That was my big awakening. Like, no, you can't. Like, I can write you a letter of recommendation. That's yeah. about it. You know, it was yeah. it was really sad to realize, um, for me to realize that. Wow, that no, yeah. it doesn't really matter. It's not. Yeah, it's that, so that, that whole thing about who you know. Like, no, it's a, such it a big disconnect apply. It's now. Some sort of computer program now. Yeah, yeah. and and I recently realized uh, and learned that uh, through a friend that at Legacy here, and I don't know what some of the other carriers do, but you get points as an applicant. So if I, as an FO, write a letter of recommendation and submit it through the portal on our company website, right. uh, they get one point. Okay. If, say, you would write something for the same person because you're a captain, they'd get two points. 
kind of a Czech airman or Mm -hmm. an instructor or something like that for Legacy, writes them a letter of recommendation. They get three points. And don't quote me on that because it's, of course, I don't work for the HR department at Legacy. I don't know what their policy is, but this is what I'm being told is how they're kind of rating these people. And then they also look at other things like how many type ratings do they have? How much total time do they have? How many road shows and events have they attended? How often do they update their resume? I was told recently by someone who was hired within the last few years that they were updating their resume every six weeks. Like every six weeks. I mean, what are you changing hours? Every time you get 100 hours, you plug. He goes, yep, yep, that's all I do. He goes, any event I go to, I add it to the bottom of the resume. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking at this person that wants to fly so bad that they're, they're itching at it. Interesting. And it, it's kind of disconcerting also right. because... Now, you know some really good aviators out there that maybe have had a hiccup or two, yeah. You know, along their journey, yeah. And you know, a lot of times those things are black cloud and they're and they're on paper, yeah. But once you get to know them, you realize wow, this is the kind of guy I want flying my grandmother, right? right? So you know, everyone has these hiccups, these journeys. Um, have you had any like really big challenges that you've had to overcome? Well, really big ones. I mean, it's it's hard to it's hard to open your mouth and say something is a big challenge when you realize you know there's some people with real struggles out there so you know it's it's all in perspective i mean sure. I, I i would rather i would rather say it the whole journey has been one continuous struggle anyone that's ever gotten into aviation knows this is not you know if, if you're here for the good times you know this is not your road show you know right. but it's not uh, a job it's really a lifestyle yeah but then to paint it on the other side and go real big struggles you know i think i was really fortunate i uh couple setbacks along the way and i always managed to land on my uh, on my feet so uh no, I, I would say if I if I think about it, I really did solo under a rainbow, you know. <laughs> wow, that's excellent. I mean, and that's wonderful news because that gives people hope as well. That you know, oh, if I get into this career field, oh, look at all the sacrifice I'm going to have, and then they get to hear, you know, someone who's had a really a nice journey, who's who's been fortunate and been lucky. You know, it's funny that you said, you know, I wish I was more in that first interview, and you said lucky, but it really sounds like you have been. I have really, been. Yes. Yeah, you've been very yeah. fortunate. Um, and at the scariest time, scariest experience that you've had behind the controls of an aircraft, would you be willing to share something like that with us? Sure, absolutely. I, I, I think uh, in commercial aviation, there was a time when we took off from San Francisco, heading for New York in a 7-6. And ironically, that morning, uh, while we were uh, holding short in uh, San Francisco, um, for some reason, the uh, the captain and I uh, were talking about Swiss Air 111, hmm. uh, an MD-11 that caught in fire. And they say, before that thing actually crashed in the ocean, um, everybody left the cockpit because molten metal was raining on them. Yeah. That's how bad it got. That's where there are shorts in the micro cracks in the overhead uh, wiring that caused the insulation that was metal coated to catch fire correct correct yeah yeah and that burned slowly in behind the panels and it migrated from the cabin all the way into the cockpit correct. where it started to drip down right that those metal insulation yeah uh metal molten shavings were falling on the falling, pilots, yeah burning them yeah yeah now not to monday morning quarterback but some of the memory i had was that the flight crew decided to troubleshoot to some degree what they had mm. um I, I think it's been proven and again I, I'm, I'm going a little bit of a limb but i think it was written had they um had they simply made for halifax and landed it would have been a different outcome they chose not to land and instead they circled it back out again and um oh. and then then they never made halifax wow um well this friend of mine captain that i was working with and i were talking about it and you know it was just in conversation the accident report for uh, swiss 111 had come out and it was like you know if we have a fire on board you know don't don't troubleshoot things you know get this thing on the ground because fire and airplanes are mutually not absolutely yeah not a good combination yeah so two hours into the flight i remember him saying hey look at this and i looked over and i thought why is this fog coming? <laughs> Why is this fog coming out of the uh, instrument panel? And as I remember, the sun was shining in through my side of the window, and I'm like, "Why is this steam coming up from from the instrument panel?" Oh my god! 
And right about there, I see his eyes and I realize, oh, this is not steam. This is smoke. And he's reaching for his oxygen mask. And I'm like, well, I, you know, you just get that moment where you go, action, you know? Yeah. And so I, you know, my oxygen mask and, you know, put a mayday out for uh, ATC. And, and they're like, hey, what do you want to go? And it's like, what's the nearest airport? And they said, uh, Gillette, Wyoming is, you know, you're two o'clock and 30 miles. And I'm like, Gillette, Wyoming, that doesn't sound like a big runway, but. Um, yeah, you know, in the meantime, we're running a checklist and starting an emergency descent and, you know, trying to figure out the source of the smoke and the fire. And, uh, long story short, we ended up, um, diverting into Casper, Wyoming. Um, but I remember before the smoke dissipated while it was still building in the cockpit, I remember looking right out my window and seeing, um, I-80 ah. and I thought, we're going to land on I-80 <laughs> yeah. in the middle of nowhere. Because I thought, you know what, in five more minutes, we won't be able to see our thing in front of our, in front of yeah. our eyes. You know, it was, it was just that dense. And just like that, it stopped and dissipated. It turned out it was um, uh, one of the uh, screens had slowly burned itself up and oh. created a tremendous amount of smoke. We never saw. Oh, and that was the other thing. I remember thinking. I see the smoke, but what am I going to do with the fire extinguisher? I can't just shoot it into something into where I see smoke. I don't see any fire. Yeah, it's coming from but, you behind know, the If there's smoke, film. there's fire. Right. Huh. <laughs> so where is it? You know? And I, I, didn't even want, I didn't want my legs to be down there by the rudders because I'm like, at what point are my, my, you know, my pants going to catch on fire? Because, you know, the fire is in there somewhere. Sure. Of course, there never was, but so, we but, didn't know. Well, you, you, how long did you remember how long it took from the moment you first noticed the smoke in the cockpit to the point where you landed? I bet you it was under 18 minutes, you know, it was just under 20 for so sure. So from altitude yeah, all the was, way down. Yeah, I mean, it was just one continuous dive, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and we landed in Wyoming and it was, okay, you know. Did you get the call from Chris Scheduling saying, okay, we got another airplane for you? <laughs> <laughs> no, that time I didn't. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the event itself is kind of a long one for, for a separate story, maybe someday. But, um, yeah, that, that, I remember that time thinking, this might not have a happy outcome and the happiest outcome might be uh, putting this thing down on uh, on Interstate 80 because yeah. literally there was not a suitable place to put that thing down immediately. Um, that was probably you know a little bit of the adrenaline hitting me, but yeah, I, I remember thinking this this is it. This yeah. is going to be your worst yeah, case this, this scenario. Be, yeah, your worst yeah. case scenario. We're going to end up on the freeway somewhere. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's probably like uh, you know like the, the biggest one thing. that sticks out. Yeah. yeah. So you know here you are doing this now for. 30 years and the biggest challenge as we aviators know this all too well we end up in these cockpits and we talk about things that are important to us aviation family children uh you know things we're interested in hobbies and we really have this opportunity to be within you know, a, an earshot and the attention of our peers, because what are we going to, what, what are we there? We're, we're monitoring systems for hours on end and we have conversations and we get to talk about family life primarily. And for some people, that's a big challenge. And for others, they had seem to adapt with being an aviator, flying for an airline, being gone two, three, four, five, six days a week sometimes, and maintaining a happy home life. And, you know, we've talked, you have, you have a, I'd say a very successful home life uh, with your family and, and you know wife and family and, and kids. And what's the secret? I mean, if if you had just had to give a quick advice to a young aviator starting out that might be starting a family of their own, and now they they're trying to get in an airline career field, what's the best advice you can give them? You know, Tony, I, I think. Um... The best advice I would give someone is to be very careful of the uh, toxic culture that exists out there. I think, um, I think, when I talk to friends who are working for other airlines and who've had different career paths, the one thing that seems to be the common denominator is um, if you buy into the belly aching, if you buy into the toxic culture of us versus them. If you really truly believe that the company is out to screw you at every turn and that's all that they want to do, you're going to end up being a better person. I, I, I really think so. I, I don't know how else to say it. I realize it's easy for me to look back. I've had a lot of fortunate breaks go my way. 
Um, but I try not to be bitter over reassignments. So I'm not trying to be bitter yeah. about not getting the vacation or the day off or the, you know, I, I try not to let that influence it. And, um, and I think um, if you don't have anything good to contribute, the least common denominator is you can bellyache. Anybody can complain. Yeah. And we're surrounded by people who love to complain. Yes, we are. And you can buy into that and go, you're right. You're right. This crew meal is horrible. And you got to remember somebody else doesn't have a crew meal or, you know, somebody else's contract doesn't get them a, room, a crew meal or somebody may, that, you know, that might make the difference between them eating that day or not because, you know, they're paying for three kids to get to college, you know, True. And, and, and they've had some bad setbacks and, you know, whatever. So it's easy to look at the fortunate things that we have, overlook them and only complain about the bad things. I'm not saying something I don't do. You've flown with me. I, I try not to bring a negative or toxic environment into sure. the cockpit and complain about things exclusively or to act like the company owes me something. So I would say, you know what? Use some common sense in that regard. Sure, there are fights that, you need, that need to be fought. You know, you may need to step up to a strike line someday and, and, you know, and hold it down for the profession. I'm not saying turnover for the company, but in day-to-day -day operations, you don't need to be toxic. And I see people who are toxic and they really truly believe that someone owes them something yeah. so, and they're so perpetually unhappy. Getting into this toxic culture and buying into it and then having the negativity and the drama and the complaining, you think that those people often take it home with them? Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. so that's really... Oh, absolutely. You start believing, you really start believing that someone you know, took advantage of you. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I, I couldn't agree with you more. I'm, I've always said the same thing. As a matter of fact, uh, in my time uh, wearing the four stripes at the previous carrier, uh, I often said to people, once that cockpit door closes, that this zone is the drama-free zone. So no. and that's the nice thing about having four stripes is, you know, you've, you've had your four stripes for a long time, is you get to set the tone. Yeah. You set the tone in the cockpit and you can easily turn to the, the person next to you and say, you know what? I don't need to hear, it. you know, say, complain to somebody else, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't like that negativity. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons I think from the onset of the show, I was, you know, introducing you saying, you know, what a positive experience it has been to fly with you because although you don't go out of your way to, you know, put on a happy face and be all cheery and chippy and all that. But it's a very positive time with you because I, I don't hear you complaining a lot. I don't right. hear you saying, oh, they're probably going to reassign us. And God, you know, crew scheduling is calling. Don't answer your phone. You know, it, it, all that energy, it just uh, negative energy, as you said, uh, it gets to you. Yes. It gets to the core of who you are and it, and it gets to the core of your decision making. Yeah. And, and like you said, you do, you do sometimes take that home with you and that just is going to turn into a bad thing at home. Yeah, because you've been gone. They they want to see you. They want you happy. They yeah. don't, they don't want to hear about your work. Yeah, I I really think uh, you if you if you say that long enough, you start convincing yourself that it's true that somebody owes you something. Yeah, and, and we that's both know that's not the case. Yeah, you know. So, so that's great advice. Um, and now to get into something a little bit more of a, a lighter question is, what's your biggest pet peeve from your fellow aviator? Ooh. Well, yeah, it probably goes along, along the same thing, though, because uh, I, unfortunately, I, I see, you know, and change is constant and it's inevitable, but I, I've seen over the 30 years, I've seen some of, the, some of the courtesies that we had for each other, some of the respect that we have to each other, you know, regardless of whether we were flying the same uniform or whether we had the same political or the same, uh, you know, outlook on whatever it was. There was a, somehow there was a professional respect that we had for each other. I've seen that erode a little bit. It saddens me. I don't know that it's necessarily a pet peeve that you're looking for, but it does sadden me. I think that to some degree we are turning into our own worst enemies. You know that's exactly what I was. That I was. I mean, not that specific, but that's what I was looking for to see. You know, what is it that you see that you're not happy that's happening out there? Whether that's something simple, minute, or something in the big, as you've given us this big picture of just this erosion of 
this common courtesy. At yeah. the end of my my uh, my episodes here of this podcast, uh, I started about ninety days ago. At the end of every single episode, I ended up with a kind of a catchphrase, and I say, now "Keep the dirty side down, take care of yourself, mm-hmm. and take care of each other." Mm-hmm. So I couldn't agree with you more. What you're saying is that there is an erosion of of uh, mutual respect. If you wear the uniform, it doesn't matter if you're flying, you know, caravans, you know, puddle jumping over caravans, uh, you know, or you're flying the the heavy over to London mm-hmm. from JFK. I mean, pilot's a pilot. Yeah. And and we really should be taking care of each other. And, and there has been an erosion, but I also think, especially in the newer crowd, the younger crowd, the regional level, mm-hmm. uh, at the entry point of a career in aviation at the airlines, I do see that technology and social media has played a role in bringing us a little bit further together. There are those online that are extremely negative, and I do everything I can to avoid reading, viewing those kind of comments and those mm-hmm. toxic people, as you said. Yeah. Um, but there are those that go, hey, you know, we just got this, and, and you know, oh, yeah, that's great. And, and they can talk about the advancements that they're having at their airline, and then you're on following their page or following that person, and, oh, yeah, that's great. And then you can bring it up to your union representative. And next thing you know, you're getting those kind of, you know, perks or increase in yeah, contract language. Right. So I think that it goes both ways. There are, I think at the upper levels, senior guys that have been around forever have been doing it their way forever. They don't want to change because they know what they have to do. They don't want to have to learn something new or learn a new way of doing something. Those guys kind of give it a hard time. I mean, I can remember I was on IOE and we flew into Charlotte. And, you know, I've been in the culture of legacy airlines for almost 15 years. And I kind of know the reputation and, you know, one group versus the other group, one base versus another base, even one type rating versus another type rating. Pilots kind of get a chip on their shoulders and they bring that negativity to the, to the line. And I can remember we came in in Charlotte. My, my Czech airman was talking to me about this and that. And, and we're walking to the aircraft that had just parked at the gate and they were deplaning and the captain came off and he walked right up to me, looked me square in the eye and goes, Hey, how you doing? Good airplane. I uh, wrote this up, this and that. And I'm looking at my captain who's standing not two inches from me to my left. Like, why, why is he talking to me? Mm-hmm. I'm a new hire. Why is he talking to me? You know, he should be talking to you. And he's just eye contact with me only. And he told me, Oh yeah, maintenance is coming out. It's in the book. You know, it should be a good fly. Have a good one. Talk to you later. And he walked off. And I was like, all right, thanks. And I, I look at my, my check airman. I'm like, what the f- was that? He goes, um, legacy, original legacy. And he's from one of the merged companies. Oh. He won't talk to me. Oil and water will mix. I said, how the hell does he know? He goes, when you've been around as long as we have, you know who... Yeah. The senior, you know, you guys have been around for a while. I'm, obviously, I'm a check airman. I got check airman wings on. I'm giving you IOE, obviously. Um, he knows that I'm not one of him, one of his group. He knows I'm one of the other groups. Oh, wow. So with all these acquisition and mergers, we have that. And I thought that kind of dissipated a little bit, but that wasn't long ago. Yeah. And so it is out there. There is that toxic yeah. element out there. Yeah. And we all do need to take care of each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's sad that it's there. It's sad that the, such politics come into play. But yeah, it's it's out there. Yeah. Last question for you. If one of your sons came to you tomorrow and said, I want to be an airline pilot, I'm going to stop what I'm doing, and I'm going to aviation school, what would you say? Well, it's already happened. Uh, so really? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a 15-year-old at home. Um, I've been flying with him since he's 10. Wow. Now, that doesn't mean we fly all the time, and it doesn't mean that I'm flight instructing. Right. We've flown. Sure. Um, he's at the point now where um, if I died on the airplane, he would be perfectly capable. I mean, he does everything. He does the pre-flight. He flies the airplane, everything. Um, and so we talked about this, and it's like, well, yeah, Dad, I think I want to be, uh, I think I want to give the, uh, you know, the, the pilot thing a shot. Mm-hmm. So we're about to buy an airplane, um, ah. only because I think it's going to be, in the long run, the cheapest way to help him get the experience and, sure. and everything. Um, does that answer your question? 
Yeah, I mean, were you happy with it? You know, yes, I am. Uh, I'm, I'm happy. I'm so worried. I, I'm thinking I had so many lucky breaks, you know, but you don't really need lucky breaks. You just need to, you know, be a solid pilot and do what you need to do yeah, and you know, you'll get there. And, yeah. I, you know, I, it's just sad because, you know, there's so much advice, so much experience. Uh, you just want to Im- impart on him and go, who knows, you know, in 10 years, computers might be flying these things for us, you know. Right. I don't really think it'll be in 10 years, but the day will come. So it's not a negative thing in your eyes. No, it's not a negative thing. Yeah. And, and I, I think I, I've told him that, yeah. Yeah, m- maybe 10 years ago, I would say no. And, I, and I've had people ask me, you know, my, my son or my, my nephew wants to become a pilot. Can you yeah. talk to him? And I make a phone call. And like, so why do you want to do it? And they're like, oh, just I love airplanes. And I always, I, you know, okay, why do you want to do it? Oh, you know, just, uh, you know, and, pilot, and at the end, oh, pilots make a lot of money. And it's like, wrong answer. No. They don't do it. And then they, you know, oh, why, why'd you tell them not to do it? I was like, it's not the right reason to do it. No. And, you know, then they'd call back. And a few times they'd call back and they go, oh, he still wants to do it. I mean, like, how does he say like, he's, he's doing it? He's doing it no matter what. Mm. I'm like, okay, now I'll give you, okay, this is what you yep. got to do. You got to come here. Because yep. now he's committed. I know he's, his heart's in it. Yeah. Um, but now uh, I'm like, this is where it's at in the next 10 years with the retirements of all the carriers, not just in the U.S., but all over Europe. It's crazy. It is amazing. The, yes. the numbers are staggering. Every few weeks, I read another article from some aviation source yes. in- indicating the numbers. And I'm like, yeah. more than half of every pilot flying in the U.S. today will retire in the yeah. next 10 years. Where are these pilots coming from? Okay, so they come from the regionals or the, the low-cost carriers or you know places mm-hmm. like that. That's fine and dandy, but who's going to replace them? Yeah. So I think your son's getting in at the right time. In the next yeah. 10 years, uh, next five, if he can get it done in the next four or five years, yeah. I think he'll, he'll still be on the beginning of that wave. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, cool. Um, you know, regardless of anything, you know, and, and this is why I told him, I'm like, listen, dude, you know, if, if you do something that you like, like, I, I think about this every now and then. Like, if, if I'd have gotten stuck flying Metrolines for the rest of my life, I don't know. It's a tough, tough question to answer because I would love to fly a Metroline today, you know? Yeah. Maybe not for those wages. Right. You know, I mean, you know, the money side is something else. But the flying part, there was never anything that I flew that I didn't enjoy flying. And I've told him that. Like, look, some of my best memories are flying things that paid the least. Yeah. You know? So keep that in mind because it was fun. It's been a fun career. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that, I just, I want to just reiterate a big thank you. Oh. For taking the time out yeah, of your pleasure. of your layover to, to to hang out with me, I, we had a blast today. It was probably yeah, it was one of my day. favorite layovers in a long yeah. time. So, uh, thanks again. Thanks for listening to Squawk Eye Den. This is Aviator Tony on behalf of myself and Captain Hans. Thank you for listening, and good luck. Thanks, Tony. Well, ladies and gentlemen, a big thank you to Captain Hans for taking the time out of his uh, layover and sitting down with me. Uh, We were talking about uh, what's involved with the podcast, and he had uh, not sat down for a podcast before, so it was uh, kind of a new experience for him, and he was so relaxed and just a wonderful a way of exploring his journey and sitting down with him. And I just want to say a big thank you to Hans. Uh, the sequence, as we mentioned uh, earlier in the podcast, is it's a, a little bit of a tough sequence because it is a four-day ending uh, with a deadhead. And it's quite an adventure when a pilot uh, you know, has these uh, back-to-back red eyes, uh, long flights at night over the ocean. And um, it can just be a tiring experience. So uh, the sequence, just to give you a little bit of uh, background on exactly what we're looking at. You know, we started out in L.A. on the 26th of December and we ended up flying to Charlotte late night, uh, ending up swapping our planes, going to Austin. I did mention this earlier in the interview. Uh, Austin was a great overnight. Uh, Next day, Austin to Dallas little bit of a sit and then Dallas to San Juan and that was the first red eye the real true red eye uh, got into San Juan uh, crashed pretty hard slept until uh, about noon one o'clock and that's when uh, Hans texted me and said hey you want to you want to go for a run you mentioned you you're going to probably run I was like absolutely this is this is great so 
we ended up uh, meeting up downstairs and going for a nice long run in San Juan. Now, I've never been there before. He had only been there a handful of times. So it was quite an experience. And we ended up, uh, our layover hotel is just north of the airport there. In, uh, and, and forgive me if I'm butchering these names, but I'll try to give as much uh, detail here as possible of the, of the San Juan locations here. So we started out just north of the airport there and kind of hiked a little bit on the busy residential areas uh, going westbound and, you know, passing by Hobby Beach. Uh, and we got to see a lot of, you know, the recovery efforts uh, through the residential area, at least uh, after the hurricane that hit a few years back, that Category 5 that just decimated San Juan um, in Puerto Rico. And, you know, it was really nice to see some of these buildings, you know, being rebuilt and having millions of dollars being put into, you know, rebuilding and revitalizing the area. However, there were also structures that were just abandoned and you could see that just have not been repaired. And that was a little bit uh, difficult to see. You know, you want to you wanna see a community get on its feet quickly. And, and San Juan has definitely you know, been through a lot. And, and, but it was nice to see a lot of the, the city being rebuilt and reborn. And so we ran um, quite a bit of ways. We decided we were going to run to the castle in Old San Juan, and it's 17 kilometers away. It was it was not a short run by any means, but we agreed that you know we would just take it easy, and then we'd Uber it back because you know something like 16 miles round trip is is quite a bit. But you know we're both relatively healthy guys, so we started running and passed uh, Punta La Maria. And kept going, Parque de Jose, Celso, Barbosa, which was a really interesting athletic park, uh, tennis courts, and a track. And we just kept going. And we eventually made it uh, onto some of the beach area over there by the, uh, the Plaza Hilton of the Condado uh, Plaza Hilton. And that area there was beautiful. Uh, crossed a, a few bridges, saw a just a bunch of iguanas uh, actually made it through an abandoned stadium uh, over there by Luis Minos Rivera Park. Uh, and it just looks like that stadium was hit really hard and just hasn't really been rebuilt yet. And that was, it was quite ominous to, to see that. But, you know, we kept, kept running and walking and running and walking and we made it past the uh, Puerto Rico National Guard Museum. And eventually, made it uh, through San, Old San Juan into the Castillo San Felipe de Moro, which was just this beautiful uh, site, historic site, with a huge uh, lawn area, these old cemetery areas. We even got to get a little bit of history there from some of the areas that were once slums and, and kind of have been rebuilt. And the streets, I, I learned that the brick or cobblestone streets in Old San Juan were, you know, made and you know, just hundreds of years ago, and they've been there ever since. And the sun bakes them so well that they actually turn a shade of blue. So the streets in San Juan are actually a blue shade. When the sun shines on them just right, it is absolutely gorgeous. You know, the old architecture, the old buildings was a treat. Uh, we initially uh, intended to just grab an Uber and come back to the, the hotel and get cleaned up and to grab lunch or something. But, you know, we were like, hey, we're, we're down here in old San Juan. Let's just find someplace cool to eat. You know, it's hopefully some kind of patio seating or something. And, and then after we eat, then we'll, we'll grab an Uber back and then we'll We'll get cleaned up and then maybe sit down for the podcast interview. And so, we're like, yeah, that's a great idea. So, of course, we both, you know, get on our phones and try to find out, you know, good places to eat around there that you know, are not touristy. I mean, there was plenty of the whole Chili's and Fridays and Burger King, but when you're in a place, especially layovers, I mean, all layovers, I, I really hate to to go to the chain restaurants. Not that there's anything wrong with these chain restaurants, it's just that, you know. 
do you want to go somewhere like a mom and pop that is going to be a unique experience and then you're going to enjoy yourself? And that's exactly what we did. So we found uh, through tripsavvy.com the number one best place in old San Juan for Mofongo, which I want to thank Javier for you know, reaching out and, and suggesting that, that we go out and get Mofongo. He, he wasn't home. Uh, Javier is a flight attendant uh, that I used to work with over at the other uh, carrier, and I, I texted him a couple days prior and said, hey, are you going to be around? Uh, maybe we can get together for a meetup. And unfortunately, he's flying, and so he wasn't going to be home. But he says, oh, well, whatever you do, Old San Juan, go check out this some mofongo, get some local beer. And that's exactly what we did. So we ended up in uh, El Habarito in Old San Juan. It was rated number one for mofongo. Uh, and according to Tripsavvy, uh, dot com. This Soul Street restaurant in Old San Juan brings out, uh, brings the outside in with an interior design inspired by its brightly painted neighborhood. As for the food, it's inexpensive Puerto Rican Creole cuisine. The restaurant is known for its trifongo, which we did order, a mix of sweet plantains, cassava, and green plantains. Now I ordered the mofongo. Uh, Hans ordered the trifongo. We we split it. It was a wonderful experience to to try a different taste. I ended up getting a uh, what they called a Christmas platter, which was just excellent, and it had a tamale that I have not had before. Uh, instead of the uh, traditional masa that I'm used to with uh, Hispanic cuisine. Uh, it had a, a different type of masa. It was more kind of gelatinous. I have to look into seeing how they make that and try to duplicate that at home. But this is what, what happened. We, we had a great meal, and uh, I'll do my best to post some of the photos uh, from that outing and that excursion on the social media websites for Squawk Ident Podcast. So if you don't follow on Facebook, Instagram, uh, and whatnot, or or even the website, uh, please make sure to to take a look. Uh, we I do add quite a bit of content on there whenever I can. So this was the trip. And I got back to the hotel relatively uh, painlessly with a, a Uber. The Uber driver was very friendly. He gave us a little bit of history. We asked him about the recovery efforts in in San Juan, and he was able to to give us a lot of information that we didn't know, and. Just what a wonderful layover experience. So uh, we, we sat down, we had the interview, uh, slept afterwards, uh, after we were all done and cleaned up, uh, slept for about four hours. And of course, wouldn't you know it, uh, as I'm laying down uh, to get a little a nap in before our red eye back to Dallas for day three, into day four, uh, I felt the whole hotel just shake a little bit. And being a Southern California guy, I I recognized it right away as an earthquake. And sure enough, a 5.0 earthquake happened at 9 p.m. in uh, in San Juan. And when I looked it up to see, was that really an earthquake? What's going on? Turns out they had four or five earthquakes that evening, all within a few hours. So yeah, San Juan is shaking, man. It was kind of crazy. But it was a great experience. I did get uh, about four hours of sleep and our departure time wasn't until 2.30 in the morning. So yeah, uh, got my rest, got all ready to go, uh, met the crew downstairs and did that uh, 2.30 departure, landed in DFW a little bit ahead of schedule. And, uh, you know, we were debating uh, and this is what we were talking about earlier about the last leg being deadhead. We were debating, do we try to hop on uh, a flight and non-rev home from there? Uh, we were each going to different locations. And so uh, we thought, yeah, maybe, maybe the flights are, will allow us to, you know, the loads will be okay. And we can, instead of getting arrested at the hotel and then deadheading back to base, maybe we can just go directly home right away and get home earlier. However, being the end of the holiday rush, there's, you know, overbooked flights and it was going to be possibly a jump seat, possibly not. And I was already pretty tired at that point. So I elected to to just go to the layover hotel and, you know, get my rest in, get my sleep in, and then head home on the scheduled deadhead 
Uh, Hans uh, elected to get some rest as well, uh, but he ended up uh, just deadheading back or jump seating actually uh, directly home uh, in the afternoon. So he cut his rest a little bit shorter, but elected to go home and good for him. You know, uh, he texted me that he got on the flight. Wonderful uh, way to get home a couple hours ahead of schedule. And this is what we do. We, we do our best to make the best of being away. And if our last leg ends in a deadhead, sometimes you can kind of get an extra few hours at home. So all in all, a wonderful trip, a great way to end 2019. And with that, 2020 is just around the corner, ladies and gentlemen. I know that a lot of you have seen on the social media websites the the memes about 2020 and how it's just around the corner with the with the roaring 20s back in and i'm looking forward to it you know these these past few months have been kind of just a head spin with so much going on and i'm sure 2020 is going to be uh just as ferocious with just keeping the keeping the ball rolling and going. I'm not um kind of guy that makes New Year's resolutions. I think resolutions are something that should be done daily. And, you know, you just always strive to be a better person and in a better place. And you do what you gotta do to get to get there. So for all of you listeners out there, I hope you had a wonderful 2019. And I here's to having a prosperous 2020 for all of you out there if you're uh, getting into aviation and you know you or maybe you're thinking about getting back in aviation i hope that this podcast has allowed you to get a little bit more insight to make good choices and a better perspective on the life and career of professional aviators so if you are listening to squawk ident on a platform that you really enjoy please remember to like and subscribe Uh, It really does help us out, especially uh, if you can give us a review. That's always appreciated as well. So don't forget to visit www.aviatortony.com. That's Alpha Victor, the number eight, Romeo Tango, Oscar November Yankee.com. And there you can listen to the show via either the anchor.fm links Uh, under the episodes tab or you can check out the unique episode cover art that i produce and uh for every show so great place to check that out i know a lot of the other platforms uh just use the the default uh, cover art and there is actually a unique cover art for each episode so i encourage you to check out the website if uh, your platform doesn't Uh, produce those unique uh, cover arts also uh, don't forget to contribute if you would like to become a producer to squawk ident and help out with a very small uh, either one time or monthly donation then i would greatly appreciate it you can do that either through anchor.fm or directly from the website so in closing i'd like to just say thank you for taking the time to listen to this grateful aviator keep the dirty side down Be safe and take care of each other.